Good afternoon. You're all very welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is John Morrissey. I'm coordinator of the Chassis Project, um, who is hosting this webinar for you today. Thank you all very much for taking the time uh, to join. So the Chassis Project, just to say a couple of words of introduction, it's a, a EU funded project Uh, which, which is aiming to develop uh, new yeast chassis for industrial biotechnology applications. So if, if you're interested in learning more about the project, uh, you, you can follow the project and ask questions on Twitter uh, at, chassis, uh, at Chassis Project, via our website, chassis.eu, or our LinkedIn group. Indeed, if you've got questions um, from this webinar that, that you don't get answered during the webinar, in case you don't get time, you can follow up by asking questions either on uh, LinkedIn or on, um, on Twitter. So this particular project um, has a range of partners who are listed on your screen here, UCC, TU Delft, Chalmers, INRA, Evolva, Gutha University, Biopetrolia, Clarient, UCC Academy and NOVA. But I'm very pleased today to be joined by two of my colleagues, Jack Pronk from the Technical University of Delft and Jens Nielsen, from uh, Chalmers University in Sweden. Um, Jack is Professor of Industrial Biotechnology, uh, Industrial uh, Microbiology and Biotechnology at the Technical University of Delft. He's an expert in microbial physiology and synthetic biology, and he's going to talk to us uh, about some of that. Uh, Jens Nielsen is Professor of Systems Biology and um, at Chalmers University. He's also the Chief Scientific Officer of Novo Nordisk in Denmark, and he's going to talk to us about systems biology and metabolic engineering. Both of these speakers have a wealth of experience in working across the academia industry interface um, and have very good insights, I think, on how we can advance yeast biotechnology and how we can develop new prospects, uh, new directions. So I think that's enough of an introduction from me. So in terms of the format, um, Jack Pronk is going to give his presentation first. It's about 20 minutes. He'll be followed by Jens Nielsen for about 20 minutes. And then we have about 20 minutes left for questions. If you have questions, uh, you can ask them as you go along. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you might need to move your cursor. You will see um, a Q&A function. If you just click on that Q&A, you'll get a window and you'll be able to ask a question. Um, as the presentation is going on, I'll be collating the questions, um, and then when we get to the end, after both presentations, I'll direct the questions um, to the appropriate speaker. So I think with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna hope the technology uh, doesn't let us down, and I'm going to ask Jack to uh, start his presentation. So, so, so Jack now um, will share his screen and he'll turn on his microphone, it's on, okay. and he, uh, he will start. Can you see and hear me, uh, John? Yes, we can see and hear you, Jack, and so you just need to share your screen now and then you're set to go. Um, I tried to do that just now, share screen. Um... Yeah, it's starting to share, Jack. Okay. okay, and now you just need to go to presentation mode. And there we go. There we go, Jack. Good afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on, uh, on where you are. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Uh, what I'd like to do is to briefly share some of the experiences of, of the Delft Group in implementing some technologies for engineering yeast genomes and yeast strains that have really transformed our academic research and that I think also have the potential to transform work in, in industry. I guess most of you in the audience will be aware that yeast are already very important platforms for production in, in the biotech industry. They're robust. There's a very well-developed large-scale fermentation technology for yeast. And there's a tremendous body of knowledge on, in particular, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, 
but increasingly also on so-called non-conventional non-saccharomyces yeasts. Developments in the, in the field have recently been driven by extremely fast developments in strain engineering technology. And this already benefits the implementation of novel product pathways in, in yeast, but also, and that's mainly what I'll be talking about today, the improvement of existing processes that use yeast cells. Now, as a, as a scaffold or as a, a sort of example that I would like to use today, I'll discuss the impact of genome editing technologies and also of evolutionary engineering on a very well established application of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and that's the production of fuel ethanol, either so called first generation ethanol production, currently still the largest single uh, process in terms of product volume in industrial biotech and also second generation ethanol production where we use uh, agricultural residues or uh, dedicated energy crops as the raw material. Oops. Now talking about genome editing at this day and age is not possible without saying a few words about what's known as the CRISPR revolution. CRISPR is a, a very simple, a very precise and also very efficient means of editing genomes and what it enables researchers to do is to, in a very targeted manner, introduce double strand breaks in DNA. This cartoon over here is not from a scientific journal or biochemical textbook, it's from The Economist, which already illustrates the, the societal impact that CRISPR has and is expected to have in the future. And it very nicely illustrates what the system does. It consists of an endonuclease, a protein that cuts DNA, but this cut is, is very much targeted by a small piece of RNA, the so-called guide RNA. And if you want to see the system in, in action, let's see if I can get this movie to, to start or not. Well, anyhow, this is a, a very charming movie, which we won't see right now, apparently, uh, which shows how this CRISPR protein, the orange blob, is moving along the DNA until it finds its cut site and then it cuts the DNA. Now, this is interesting because loose ends in DNA are very, very nice places to explore for genetic engineers. They're fantastic sites to introduce specific mutations, to insert novel genes, or to eliminate existing genes. One of the fantastic possibilities that this system offers is multiplexing. So not just introduce a single mutation at a time in one site, one locus in the genome, but to introduce multiple mutations at the same time. And I'll illustrate this in a, in a few minutes. A note of caution here, although the science is uh, tremendously well resolved, this does not hold for the intellectual property rights. There are still legal fights going on right now, and the advice, especially to small and medium enterprises entering this field, would be to inform yourself really well about the current legal status before committing to uh, any variant of this technology. Now, it's very simple to, to narrow down um, genome editing to just CRISPR, and in fact, that would be an oversimplification. There's a number of other techniques that have contributed a lot to the current acceleration in the field. And one of those that's particularly important also for yeast engineering is recombination-based assembly of DNA fragments. Instead of old-fashioned methods in which we used restriction enzymes and glycases to cut and paste together DNA fragments, we increasingly use recombination either in vivo or in vitro to assemble large numbers of fragments, to several dozens at a time, uh, with a, a, an unprecedented precision and uh, re reproducibility. Also, custom DNA synthesis, which enables us not only to make novel and optimized gene sequences, but also to synthesize linker fragments that we can use for this assembly, has really sped up the field. Also here, costs are decreasing, Although the decline uh, for us as users could be a bit faster still. Then, as the constructs we're making 
questioning and editing become more and more complicated and technically involved, quality control becomes more and more essential. And whole genome resequencing, whole genome DNA resequencing, has become indispensable as a means for checking the constructs we make. And this has become possible because whole genome sequencing has become a lot cheaper than it was a few years ago, and I'll come back to that later. So to illustrate how things have sped up, I'd like to go back to some of the, well, the most ancient uh, research in our group on pentose fermentation by Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Fifteen years ago, we were still talking about the pentose challenge, the inability of Saccharomyces cerevisiae to convert two sugars, xylose and arabinose, that are very abundant in these second generation feedstocks for ethanol production. Now we spent a number of years in our group, and similar work has been done elsewhere, to engineer Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains by the expression of isomerase-based pathways for metabolism of xylose and also oops, for the metabolism of arabinose. Now zooming, on, zooming in on xylose first, and this required already quite a, a substantial set of genetic modifications, about seven or eight of them, which over a period of a, a number of years, we sequentially introduced one by one into the yeast genome and found that this really helped to get the yeast to ferment xylose. Similar work was done in, in arabinose, and around 2010, this provided us with academic strains, strains doing their job under academic conditions, that fermented all three sugars, glucose, xylose, and arabinose. Going back to the xylose part of the work a little bit, the strain engineering work here cost us about three years. Of course, there was some planning in between, but just building the strains, checking them, and moving on to the next step over the period of about three years. And a few years ago, Martin Verhoeven, a PhD student in the group, decided to give this another try, but now using the set of techniques that I just discussed. So CRISPR-based genome editing, in vivo assembly, and checking the constructs for whole genome resequencing. And essentially all the modifications, and even if they were a little bit more than what we did in the original strains, was introduced without any, having any plasmids floating around, everything neatly integrated in one locus in the genome, and this took six days instead of three years, which I think is a nice illustration of how these developments speed up the field. And of course, the strains feed grow and xylose after these modifications. Now, this is a very simple example of how relatively simple uh, genetic engineering strategies can be accelerated. But of course, the more, much more interesting thing is that we can now access much more complicated engineering strategies. And there's already a couple of very, very beautiful examples of that in the literature um, of expressing complicated pathways, like, for example, opioid synthesis in yeast done by Smoky Group at Stanford in the United States, who have shown that the expression of a large number of plant genes enabled Saccharomyces cerevisiae to make opioids. This sort of daring metabolic engineering uh, strategies has become a lot more accessible now with the availability of the, the tool set that I just mentioned. We can also use these technologies to improve the chassis, the core machinery of these cells for very well established products. And this example from our, from our own group, I'd like to explain in a bit more detail. Five years ago, we published a strategy for improving the yield of ethanol and feedstock in first generation bioethanol processes. A very well established process that has been around for years. And we hypothesized and subsequently also showed that expression of autotrophic enzymes, let's say, carbon dioxide fixing enzymes, phosphoribulokinase over here, and ribulose 1 5 bisphosphate carboxylase, enabled a higher ethanol yield in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This was a nice proof of the principal study, but we 
strong impact on ethanol yield, a 13% increase of yield, which is very relevant for a bulk product like ethanol, was achieved in chemostat process. And we were unable at the time to demonstrate the same improvement of performance in fast growing batch cultures. So in the subsequent years, we devised a strategy to optimize those strains so that they would also work under industry relevant conditions. And this involved quite a large set of genetic modifications. We had to alter the regulation of one of the genes to avoid toxic effects. We had to overexpress genes in the pentose phosphate pathway to improve supply of this glucosa molecule, the substrate for phosphoridylokinase. We had to integrate multiple copies of the Rubisco gene expressed to chaperonins, and we also had to alter the native glycerol pathway. Now, all in all, this would have presented quite a hurdle in terms of strain engineering only three or four years ago. However, Janus Papa Petridis, who did this work in our laboratory as a PhD student, took less than a month to construct this train, with all the modifications chromosomally integrated using the tool set that I just briefly described. And this train now had a wild type growth rate in anaerobic batch cultures on glucose and showed the anticipated increase in ethanol yield without the need to go to low growth rates for chemostat cultures. So, CRISPR-assisted yeast genome editing enables an extreme acceleration of, let's say, conventional metabolic engineering, but it also enables us now to access much more complex strain designs than were hitherto practical. There are also options for combinatorial design, so generate multiple pathway configurations at the same time, and then do screening for the most optimal configurations. This toolbox continues to expand at a very fast rate. Also, for example, and Jean-Marc Daron and others in our group have worked on this intensively, the introduction of other CRISPR variants like CPF1 instead of Cas9. These tools are also increasingly applicable in non-saccharomyces yeast, and also here Jean-Marc and colleagues have uh, recently published about the tool that can be used in multiple yeasts at the same time. And automation is becoming a very strong trend here. These techniques can be standardized to such an extent that they can be operated by robots at a very large scale. I'd like to change gears here now a little bit and switch to another complementary approach to engineer microbial genomes, and these genomes in particular. And this is called evolutionary engineering or sometimes adaptive laboratory evolution. What we do in evolutionary engineering is to apply a selective pressure on a growing culture that favors, that specifically favors mutants that have a trait of interest. Let's say tolerance to a toxic compound, fast growth on a particular substrate, or whatever else we're interested in. And then we keep this culture growing for a long time under the selective pressure until the culture has been taken over with mutants with improved performance, which we can then subsequently isolate and characterize. The advantage of this approach over targeted engineering is that it does not require prior detailed knowledge on the molecular mechanisms that underlie the trait. And it can be very easily automated as well by having computer controlled batch reactors, sequencing batch reactors, continuous cultivation reactors, and all by the use of robotics. Now there's all sorts of industrially relevant traits to which we can apply evolutionary engineering. And those have one thing in common. The selective pressure should act on single cells and lead to an increased growth rate or increased survival. So this offers a lot of possibilities uh, and once we've applied this principle and, and isolated evolved strains or indicated by the, the red these mutants that have popped up, we can analyze their genome. Until cheap genome re sequencing became available, this approach to a large extent remained a black box approach. But whole genome resequencing has really opened up this black box and enabled us 
to very rapidly identify mutations in the DNA that may have contributed to improved performance and to check which of these mutations are indeed causal. We can use, again, the genome editing toolbox to introduce them into non-evolved strains, analyze their performance, and find out which ones are really contributing. This generates two types of outputs. First, it teaches us how the system works and learn from this, extend our knowledge, but it also generates portable genetic elements. We do not have to repeat these experiments all the time when we move to different strain backgrounds, laboratory strains to industrial strains, for example, but we can simply transfer the mutations to different backgrounds. As an example, I'll show some work very briefly on acetic acid tolerance. Acetic acid is an integral component of plant biomass and therefore also an inevitable component of plant biomass hydrolysates, substrates for second generation bioethanol production. And yeast strains, in particular xylose fermenting yeast strains, do not like acetic acid at all. And this is illustrated here for, for glucose clone cultures. Unless cells are pre-adapted to acetic acid by growing them at a, a lower permissive concentration of the inhibitor, they stop growing above a certain concentration. And only after pre-adaptation can they continue to grow at higher concentrations. Now, I won't go into this picture in detail. That would take too long. But basically, what we've done is to set up a dynamic selection protocol where we alternated cycles of growth in the presence of the inhibitor. Its concentration was increased over time with cycles in which there was no acetic acid present. And those strongly favored cells that did not require this pre adaptation. We ran this experiment a number of times in parallel. And indeed, the strains that were isolated in this way all showed a much higher degree of acetic acid tolerance in the absence of pre-adaptation than in the case of the non evil parental strain. Now, the question then is how do you get as fast as possible to the underlying mutations so that you can check them in other backgrounds? Well, as I said, whole genome resequencing is really a large part of the answer here. And this is what we, we did. We sequenced multiple strains that had become acetic acid tolerance without the need for pre-adaptation. And we found between 5 and 21 different mutations per involved strain. Six genes were involved in multiple strains. Now, instead of going straight to reverse engineering of these mutations, we first applied a trick that works beautifully well in, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and that's classical genetics. So we mated the evolved strains with a non-evolved acetic acid sensitive strain, and then sporulated the resulting diploid. And we then we checked which of the mutations we find segregated with acetic acid tolerance. So we checked the acetic acid tolerance of the segregant and so which of the mutations were reproducibly associated with that tolerance. So this gave us four genes for mutations, different mutations in, in different strains, but in the same four genes. And indeed, when we then reintroduced combinations of these genes, we were able to show that the resulting strains approached the tolerance of the involved strains. And especially this combination with classical genetics makes the technique extremely powerful and, and reliable. So evolutionary engineering is a complementary and powerful approach for improving this performance. Genome sequencing enables fast identification of mutants, and classical genetics can be a big help in sifting causal mutations and noise. Also here, CRISPR-assisted genome editing facilitates reverse engineering and the important trends I don't have time to discuss here our, our automation, definitely, of the whole evolution process. And a new trend is to also apply this very powerful method to um, phenotypes and genotypes that do not by themselves confer a selective advantage to yeast cells. 
So, for example, these cells do not have a particular advantage uh, of make, in making products that cost ATP, the synthesis costs ATP. But we may be able to engineer around that by building synthetic regulatory circuits that confer a selective advantage to product for microbes. And this approach, I think, we'll hear about a lot in the coming years. So coming to the end of this, this brief presentation, I'd like to thank the, the partners in Chassis. And I'd particularly like to thank this gentleman for his uh, very inspired and inspiring lead in the project. I'd like to thank my colleagues and sponsors of our work in Delft, and in particular, my colleague Jean-Marc Garon, um, who's leading our work uh, in, in the CRISPR area. He's also our conscious in, conscience in, in molecular biology, uh, and with whom I enjoy working in, uh, in Chassis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks uh, a lot, Jack. Um, so if anybody has got questions for Jack, uh, from his presentation, you can stop sharing the screen there now, Jack. Yeah. Uh, if anyone's got uh, questions for, for Jack from his presentation, you can use the Q&A function that, that's on your screen. And uh, you, you can type your questions. And um, after Jens's presentation, uh, we will um, we'll put the questions to, to Jack or Jens. So we're just going to switch over to uh, Jens Nielsen now. And Jens is just about to share his screen there and uh, Jens will give his uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, so, uh, and thank you, Jack, for a very nice presentation, and, and John also for organizing and, and, and introducing this. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, systems biology, uh, particularly with focus on the yeast metabolism and how we uh, can advance uh, using mathematical models to begin to find uh, metabolic engineering targets. So, but before I get into uh, some of the modeling work and, and quantitative uh, omics characterization, uh, let's, uh, let's just rephrase that uh, and, and remember, remind ourselves that yeast is not only a, a very important uh, industrial host organism, but it's also a very important model organism for studying eukaryotic biology. So uh, yeast has been used uh, to, for example, unravel uh, many of these interactions. It's illustrated in this uh, slide here. Uh, we have uh, AMPK, which in yeast is called SNF1, which is a major energy sensor in all eukaryal cells. Uh, how it interacts with uh, the TOR complex, which is a nitrogen sensor, basically. Uh, and, and these two are kind of controlling uh, very much cell proliferation, but also many uh, important metabolic pathways. And much around uh, the regulation of these two uh, key kinases uh, has been on, uh, resolved by using yeast as a model organism. Uh, but of course, uh, our focus here is uh, the use of yeast as a cell factory. Um, and it is used uh, extensively. We heard uh, some very nice stories from, from Jack about engineering yeast for improved uh, bioethanol production, but also a number of other products uh, have been produced using yeast uh, and are being produced today using yeast as, as a cell factory. And uh, even more uh, are in the pipeline uh, for being developed. And uh, many of the reasons for this is, uh, is particularly that yeast is very robust. Um, it's extremely well characterized. Uh, it, it's genetically tractable uh, and it's uh, generally regarded and safe for production of many different uh, uh, products. So, uh, so this is one of the reasons that we have uh, in my lab focused very much on using yeast as, a, as what we call a platform organism. So we've been looking into if we can uh, engineer yeast to produce a whole range of different chemicals. Uh, so these range from, uh, from fatty acids and fatty acid derived chemicals uh, to commodity chemicals like 3-hydroxypropionic acid and chimeric acid, which are important uh, building blocks in the chemical industry, to more fine chemicals uh, like sesquiterpenes uh, and uh, ornithine, resveratrol, uh, but also more uh, specialty products like antibiotics and, and, and uh, uh, recombinant proteins. And in connection with that, we are developing a number of synthetic uh, biology tools and systems biology tools to kind of advance this uh, engineering of, of yeast. And here I'm mainly going to focus on work that we've been doing on systems biology. And the reason why uh, we are currently focusing a lot on developing uh, systems biology tools 
is that uh, as we've heard uh, from, from Jack's presentation, there's been a lot of advancement in terms of build uh, recent years, particularly CRISPR-Cas technology has really advanced our ability to, to make multiple genetic modifications even in, in, in one go uh, through multiplexing. Uh, but we've also seen a number of tools that allows us to test. Uh, many biosensors have been uh, developed that allows us to, for example, use high throughput methods for, for testing and screening of strains. But what is really uh, limiting our advancements today is very much about the design, but also acquiring and, and, and collecting the knowledge that we are uh, obtaining through these, going through this uh, design build uh, test cycle. And so that's uh, where uh, mathematical models, of course, can, can uh, assist with and hopefully drive uh, this, this for field forward. And so uh, my hope is, of course, that we eventually can be in a situation like we are in any other engineering discipline where computer models are used uh, as an integrated part of the design. Um, the challenge we are up, uh, clearly facing in biology is that we don't have all the knowledge uh, still uh, but uh, I would argue that also by using an extensive modeling framework would actually uh, assist in discovery and, and uh, when the models are failing would give us new knowledge about how, what needs to be incorporated in order to, uh, to really get uh, increased knowledge about our cell factory. So if we turn specifically to yeast metabolism, um, it has, the yeast cell has about uh, 2,000 metabolic reactions. Um, they are associated with about 900 genes, uh, as we know now. Uh, this is about 15% of the yeast genome that is allocated to metabolism. Uh, as you will see later, it's a, it's a larger fraction, though, of the proteome uh, in terms of mass that is allocated for metabolism. But it's, uh, these 15% is, is actually seems to be rather conserved across many species uh, that this is what a cell is allocating for, uh, for metabolic functions. If we look at the, uh, the, the metabolism and how it is connected, then uh, we see a pattern where it's definitely not how we are taught biochemistry. Uh, the way we are taught biochemistry is, of course, by going through individual pathways one by one. Start often with the Empnemeyerhof Panas pathway or glycolysis, as we often call it. We move on to TCA cycle, maybe we branch out to the pentose phosphate pathway, and so on and so on. Uh, and so we learn. Uh, pathways, and, and this is kind of our view of how metabolism is operating, that it's segmented into these individual pathways. But as you can see here, this is definitely not the case. Uh, what is shown here is an interaction graph of uh, all the enzymes uh, and how they are connected with each other by sharing different metabolites. And the metabolites are colored uh, according to which compartment in the cell they are present in, either the cytoplasm, here we have mitochondria, uh, here we have uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum and so on. And you can see that, that it, it's extremely connected, uh, the, the metabolic network here. So clearly, uh, if, if we have a perturbation in one of these enzymes here, it will really migrate out through this whole metabolic network here. And it's therefore very hard to make a simple predictions, uh, rational design, I would say, without using uh, models to assist in this. But there is another uh, interesting constraint uh, that uh, we are often uh, forgetting, and that is that the, the total proteome uh, in the cell is, is really constrained also. And in, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this is really, this is constrained of about half of the cell mass, uh, more precisely about 45% uh, of the cell mass is allocated to proteins. And uh, what is shown here is that uh, how the, that uh, proteome mass is distributed into different cellular functions. We have a whole large chunk here to the ribosomal system and translation machinery in general. Uh, we have something for, for chaperones. We have something for glycolysis. You can see it's also a, a big chunk. Amino acid biosynthesis. This is here for yeast grown at a minimal medium. Uh, here for oxidative phosphorylation and so on and so on. Then what you can see is that this is at a reference condition uh, when yeast is grown in a chemostat at dilution rate 0.1. But if we turn uh, up the temperature, uh, yeast gets stressed. Uh, what happens is that it starts actually to activate uh, uh, ethanol fermentation. Over here, we have complete respiration. And we can see that there's now allocated more proteome mass to glycolysis. We can zoom in and look at individual proteins. And we can see, for example, that PGK1 
uh, is increasing. We can also see that PVC pyruvate uh, decarboxylase, uh, which is a, a main, main enzyme for conversion of pyruvate into ethanol, is, is upregulated and so on. So this uh, view here gives us this uh, very cl clear illustration of that when, uh, as, when a certain group or one individual protein goes up, something else has to go down. And this is something that I think we often tend to forget when we do metabolic engineering. But we're often just overexpressing uh, heterologous enzymes, uh, and, but, but that would actually have a trade-off uh, in the cell because something else has to go down uh, within the proteome. And, and therefore, again, this is another area where we can begin to use models to actually compensate for this and, and use them to describe what are the consequences of expressing uh, heterologous pathways. So this is the question, how can we, uh, how can we uh, perform integrative analysis of this kind of data? And here we are using uh, this concept of genome scale metabolic models. Uh, these are comprehensive uh, uh, network models where we are compiling information about all the individual reactions. Um, so we, we have here, for example, the stoichiometry. Uh, we are compiling information about cofactors used in these reactions. The enzymes that are catalyzing this, this can be, for example, here, uh, isoenzymes. So we kind of have an or relationship here. It can be either E1 or E2, but it can also be protein complexes that are enzymes. So here we have an end relationship. We need both P4 and P5 to form this enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. So all this information we can compile. Uh, when we have done that uh, genome-wide in yeast, we get the network that I showed you before. Um, and, uh, and this network uh, clearly provides information about the connectivity of all the different reactions. But it, we can also have a mathematical representation of this, uh, uh, and this is what we can use uh, going forward. Now, uh, what we are uh, particularly interested in is to begin to expand uh, the footprint of these classical models that are uh, using this concept of flux balancing to, to begin to incorporate this constraint of uh, uh, proteome allocation, as I talked about. And, and it, this could best be illustrated if we look at a very uh, simple pathways of three steps. We could talk about a, a low efficient pathways where we have low KCAT values versus a high efficient pathway where we have high KCAT values. If these two pathways, with everything else being equal, were going to operate at the same flux, we would need more proteome mass allocated to this pathway than to this one. And as I said, uh, that proteome mass doesn't come for free. Expressing this per pathway versus this one here, this one will give uh, larger trade-offs uh, trade in terms of, uh, of cell growth, for example, and others. So it's very important to consider uh, uh, particularly the KCAT information, but actually also the protein size, because that is also something that, that counts in, of course, in the proteome allocation. So what we are doing uh, in our modeling concept is that we are beginning to consider the enzyme costs. So traditionally, we have this flux balancing concept where we balance fluxes around each metabolite. So flux in equals fluxes out, as illustrated here. Uh, but uh, we are now expanding this to, to consider cost of building the enzyme. So if it's a large enzyme, that means that there is a, a particularly uh, or large cost with that but also kinetic constraints imposed by, by the enzyme. So is the KCAT high or low is also considered. And so hereby we get penalty for using long pathways that have inefficient and I would also say large enzymes. And so this is what we call gecko modeling approach. Uh, uh, and so you can see here the way we, the formulation goes is that, that, that we are capping and constraining the upper rate uh, through each individual reaction by the KCAT multiplied by the enzyme concentration. And, and here we can use then quantitative proteomics, for example, to insert uh, in these uh, values here, and we collect KCAT from databases. Or what we can do is also we can let the model calculate distribution of the proteome and just say that the sum of all the proteins should be within a certain fraction that is allocated for enzymes in the model. And this we can have, for example, from, from proteomics data also. What we can get uh, with this kind of modeling is really much improved predictive performance. I'm not going to go into details about it here. Uh, but also what we can do is we can get insight into enzyme distribution into specific pathways. And I would rather talk a little bit more about that. 
So uh, when we uh, introduced this modeling concept, uh, we were interested to see if we could explain uh, the Crabtree effect, which has for, for a long time been uh, 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 partly explained by regulatory constraints or kinetic constraints, but we were interested to see, can it simply just be explained by this proteome allocation uh, process? So uh, just very briefly about the Crabtree effect, when yeast is exposed to high glucose concentration, it uh, prefers to uh, convert most of the glucose into ethanol by fermentation rather than having full respiration where you, of course, get much more uh, ATP out of, uh, of the process or per moles of glucose. And one could speculate and say, why, why would you not want to capture more ATP uh, per moles of glucose? Well, there is additional cost about activating respiration and TCA cycle because you have many more enzymes here. And, and uh, some of these enzymes are even large and, and, and complex. Uh, you also have the whole respiratory system. So yes, you get more ATP, but it's also more expensive to build this uh, respiratory system than the fermentation route. And exactly when we do take this into consideration, as I said, the protein mass, the sizes of the protein and the catalytic efficiency, it turns out that this shift that when the cells have to grow faster and the demand for ATP increases, it simply is better to shift and actually use a fermentation route because you can get more ATP per protein mass on the return of that. And, and this can now completely explain this turn off of ethanol production, as you see here, when you go up in growth rates, get a little bit of acetate production even, you get an increase in CO2 production, decrease in oxygen consumption and increase in glucose consumption. And you can even begin from the model also see how different pathways are, are changing in flux your oxidative phosphorylation is decreasing uh, above a certain critical dilution rate. And as I said, uh, the, this enzyme constraint model, as we call it, can give much better prediction of uh, experimental growth rates uh, compared with just flux balance analysis that simply misses to, to predict a number of growth on a number of these different carbon sources, primarily because it, uh, for these are all fermentative carbon sources, so to speak, that, that result in, in the Crabtree effect. The yeast, uh, the current yeast model with proton allocation still uh, have some places where it deviates, for example, here on trehalos, uh, where it's over predicts significantly. Uh, this is probably because of additional regulation or constraints associated with trehalose metabolism that we don't have in the model at the moment. So we also were interested to, to, to go further and see if we uh, could then uh, combine this multi-omics analysis with the modeling to get insight into what is really controlling uh, growth. And so there we, we looked again into this classical series of experiments where we are increasing the dilution rate uh, of, uh, of yeasts, and so basically the growth rate. Um, we will then have an increased uptake of glucose, as you can see here, and up to the critical dilution rate. And when we surpass that, there, there is an increase in slope here. You get onset of ethanol production, you get an increase in, in CO2 production, and you get a leveling off of oxygen consumption. And for each dilution rate, which was carried out in triplicate, uh, we measured a number of uh, omics, uh, RNA-seq for, for transcriptome, proteomics, phosphoproteomics, metabolomics, and we also quantified fluxes using, using the model. And all these data here were done and so in, in absolute, uh, absolute quantitative level, so we get copies per cell. So here you see the, the distribution of the proteomics uh, or the proteome ac across these different dilution rates. And what you see here now clearly is that you have this increase in allocation of proteome for translation. So uh, we see this uh, clearly uh, allocation of more and more proteome for uh, transla translating and actually synthesizing protein. Uh, interesting enough, we, see an in we saw an increase in glycolytic flux, but we see actually a decrease in, in allocation of proteome for the central carbon metabolism, which is basically glycolysis here. For biosynthesis, it's a little bit different, uh, and so, uh, but we see uh, really some, some overall changes here. And we zoom into specific uh, biological processes. We see, as a, it was very clear from the previous map, this very strong linear correlation between ribosomal system allocation of, of protein to, to, to ribosomes with specific growth rate. It's increasing linearly here with a remarkable strong uh, Pearson. 
we see for amino acid biosynthesis, we also see increase in growth. For nucleotide biosynthesis, we also see increase. It's a very low slope here, but there is an increase. Whereas when we look into glycolysis, as I said, that is decreasing. And for lipid biosynthesis, there also is a decreasing, particularly at the higher specific growth rate, uh, which we uh, uh, believe is allocated it due also to change it in, in cell volume, which will also change the lipid content uh, per, per cell, per gram dry weight. Uh, we were also looking into what happens if we compare proteome fraction uh, allocated to different processes uh, below the critical dilution rate. So that means a purely respiratory condition to above. And you can see translation is, is, is here. That's because of the linear curve here. But you can see that there are, for example, mitochondria is changing, uh, whereas in glycolysis is, is also changing here. So uh, according to this picture here. But for many of the many of the other standard processes, uh, you can see here transcription, stress, and so on. Uh, it's actually a, a constant fraction that is allocated at these two conditions. So we therefore zoomed in uh, on on glycolysis specifically uh, because we saw uh, some clear differences. We see this increase in flux, but we see decrease in. Uh, in, in proteome allocation for glycolysis. So we were interested to see how that, that translates into individual enzymes. And here we're looking into a number of the individual enzymes. You can see that they have decreasing levels with increasing uh, dilution rate, whereas flux is increasing. There's one deviation from this. This is hexokinase 2 here. We have a very strong correlation between flux, protein level, and messenger RNA level. Interesting enough, we see actually across here very strong correlation between uh, absolute messenger RNA level and protein level, which is something we see across from all enzymes in the cell. Uh, but, but clearly this points to that there must be additional uh, or different types of regulation that controls uh, the activity of these enzymes in glycolysis. And it turns out that it's really very much related to uh, the, the phosphoproteomics uh, allocation. So uh, what we see is that a number of the phosphopeptides uh, here, for example, glucokinase 1 or PFK1 or PFK2 here, we see decreased phosphorylation, and this is indicated by the red lines, of several of these phosphopeptides across dilution rate. And actually there is a negative, a very strong negative linear correlation between the abundance of the phosphopeptides and flux, and flux is the, the black line here. Uh, so this, uh, this clearly shows that we get a dephosphorylation of these enzymes, and hereby they are likely going to be more active, and therefore they, that can compensate for the fact that the protein abundance is actually uh, decreasing for many of these enzymes. So in conclusion, this allows us to do this uh, global mapping of flux control. So we can uh, go in and say uh, that, for example, from the EMP pathway or glycolysis, we have some element of enzyme saturation. I didn't talk too much about that, but we can see that from the metabolomics data. We have a very strong regulation by uh, uh, protein phosphorylation. We do have some elements of allosteric regulation. We do have transcriptional regulation for one key enzyme, hexokinase 2, but basically not for any of the other enzyme. Whereas really for many other processes in the cell, uh, and particularly for, uh, for uh, amino acid biosynthesis and translation, we have very strong transcriptional regulation. Uh, and uh, whereas we see also for many other processes, there's less com contribution of protein phosphorylation, whereas enzyme saturation seems to be a, a more important factor. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that constraining the proteome allocation uh, in the cell really allows uh, us to have much improved prediction by these genome scale metabolic models. Uh, really that the growth rate is to a large extent controlled by translational machinery and that biosynthesis is, is, is mainly controlled by protein level, but central car metabolism has really evolved to have this excess capacity of low growth rate. And so therefore it has additional uh, regulatory uh, features inserted. And, and we can of course discuss why uh, the cell has evolved to be uh, operating like that. So let me acknowledge uh, the people who's been do, doing much of the work here. Uh, 
Benjamin Avland uh, have been doing, and together with Cheng here, much of the uh, modeling, all the modeling work here. Ibrahim also advancing some of the modeling work. Petri has been working very much on the quantitative proteomics. Uh, and, and then uh, visiting Professor G&E uh, was working on the analysis of this growth rate curve here together with you. And uh, Verena uh, Sievers has been assisting uh, and coordinating many of these projects and our collaborator who did the proteomics and the funders and, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Jack. Uh, Jens, that, that was uh, very informative. And, and also Jack for your informative talk. So uh, if people have questions, you can put them in the panel. Um, and I've got a couple of questions in already, so I'm just gonna direct those to people. So Jack and Jens, you should maybe have your microphones turned on, please. So I have a question here for uh, Jack. The question is whether the evolutionary improved trait uh, for acetic acid tolerance is stable if the strain is stored for longer at minus 80 or grown a YPD for a longer time um, do, you, do you maintain the trait? Well after freezing uh, definitely uh, and, and thawing uh, the, the phenotype is, uh, is still there we did not check for very prolonged growth under, under non-selective conditions but after just uh, a few cycles of patch cultivation the cells are definitely still as tolerant as directly after uh, evolution. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, I, I have a question for Jens. Yeah, Jens, the, um, the I'm just looking here and paraphrasing. The, the, the work you did is very related to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Do you, do you think that work on how glycolysis is regulated at the different levels? Is also going to apply to other yeasts which are maybe not so optimized for ethanol production? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, we, would, we would probably see different uh, types of regulation of, of glycolysis. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, of course, has this feature that it can have this extremely high flux through the glycolytic pathway. And, and therefore, it has uh, probably evolved to have a relatively large allocation of proteome for that, uh, for that pathway. Uh, what is interesting, of course, to see that it seems that at low dilution rates, uh, it's actually allocating even excess capacity uh, for this pathway here. Uh, but but I, think, uh, I think this will be different. But this, this is something we'll have to look into. Uh, for example, if you go to Clivomyces or Yerovia, as we're doing in Chassis, to see uh, how are the similarities when we look across dilution rates uh, in terms of proteome allocation. And I think that'll be super exciting. Okay, thanks, Jens. Um, I have a long question here as well. Um, I'm going to read this out, and e e either Jack or Jens can answer this one. It says, uh, yeast is indeed a workhorse for ethanol production, but when it comes to other products, uh, for example, organic acids like succinic acid, it lags behind prokaryotic hosts in terms of yield and productivity. Um, and I, I suppose maybe the first part, so why, why do you think this is? Shall I try to respond to that? Yeah, sure, Jack. Um, but there are beautiful examples of very high yield succinic acid production by, by prokaryotes. Uh, the, the work of Sengdu Lee in, in Korea, I think, is a fantastic example of that. Uh, the, the main difference between those prokaryotic strains and the, the currently engineered strains, the currently available engineered strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae in particular, is that the bacterial systems use succinic acid production as their sole catabolic pathway. Processes are anaerobic and there's a direct select selection for the productivity and in a way also to yield. The engineered yeast systems still require respiration to generate ATP. So the, the dicarboxylic acid production is not the sole source of ATP. And in fact, the processes may even still require some ATP. And a, a, key, a key factor in that definitely is, is the export of the acids across the, the plasma membrane, which is an, an HP requiring process. And in addition to that, redox metabolism and compartmentation of redox metabolism uh, causes some challenges in, in the yeast system. Having said that, there are commercial applications of, of yeast based succinic acid production in particular, which 
although there is a, a concession uh, or a compromise with respect to yield, do profit from the fact that the asset can be made at low yield. Okay, thanks, Jack. I think you answered the second part of that question there. Um, I have a question for Jens. Jens, the question is, how can the gems specifically be used for industrial metabolic engineering approaches? Yeah, so this is a, a good question also. So I think uh, the, the, the models are used uh, quite extensively uh, in, in by many companies. Uh, for, for a couple of different things. Uh, one thing is that uh, before you start a metabolic engineering uh, effort, it, the models can, can allow you to calculate a maximum theoretical yield very, very easily. And, and it's, it's good to know what are the kind of the upper uh, theoretical yield that you can get for glucose and particularly for many processes where glucose cost is the major cost uh, for, for producing the, the, the product of interest. And so that allows you to do a, at least initially some back of the envelope type of uh, uh, economic calculations of whether a process, you know, should you pursue this process or can you even compete with existing production routes? Secondly, uh, the models are very useful in terms of kind of evaluating different scenarios. So uh, uh, you know, what if I insert this pathway or I go via this route here, what, how, how would that impact yield? The models have been less efficient uh, so far in terms of kind of guiding specific targets and say, okay, I need to attenuate or I need to increase expression of this particular enzyme. But this is, of course, where I hope that our new modeling approach where we incorporate information about proteomics and KCAT values that we can actually begin to, to also address these issues. Uh, but, but this is still, of course, to be proven whether, whether that is the case. Okay, thanks, Jens. J Jack, I have, a, I have a question myself. This didn't come on the list, but uh, I, I was at a kind of a CRISPR workshop a couple of weeks ago. And there was a lot of talk about off-target effects um, of, of Cas9 in particular. Is this something that you've had much uh, problems with or experienced much uh, with yeast systems? Um, in our hands, it's not been a major problem. But of course, uh, an, an occasional point mutation somewhere would be less of a problem in the yeast strain than in, in, in gene therapy. Um, we, we, we sequenced John Marcus we sequenced quite a lot of strains constructed with uh, assisted genome editing, and we have no indications for, for major problems there in the sense of off-target off cutting by, by Cas9. Okay, okay. okay. It cannot exist. I mean, the, 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 the sample is, is significant, but that's in, in terms of number, but it doesn't mean that that cannot be effect. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm just looking to see. I don't have any more questions on, on the list at the moment. So we, we've, um, well, we've come to the end of our allocated hour. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Jack and, and Jens for, for giving those presentations, which I think were excellent, really informative. Um, I'll, th I'll, I'll thank uh, all, all the people who attended, uh, asked questions and listened. If you do have further questions, as I mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to, um, to send those to us via the, the LinkedIn group or indeed via Twitter, um, and we'll do our best to respond to those. And you can keep updated on the project and on developments on use by technology on the Chassis website. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, John.